Protecting endangered species. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Technology is really testing me today. Anyway, um, before we get into um, talking about specific endangered species, it's kind of important to understand um, the different ways to classify animals or um, categorize them by group. So taxonomy is the branch of science that focuses on classification of organisms or living beings. Um, so it examines how animals developed over time and compares their similarities and differences. So that's how um, roughly we have an idea of which animals evolved into which other species, which uh, species are related to each other. So you can kind of see down here uh, the phylogenetic tree of life shows that there's um, three domains and uh, from each domain we break off into subcategories which then further break down into subcategories and that's what this graphic over here is showing. So domain and kingdom are the most broad classifications. So bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota are the three domains. And then kingdom are these little lines broken up here. So animals are its own kingdom that fall under eukaryotes or multicellular organisms. So that's getting into some more advanced biology, but basically it's just important to understand that there are broad classifications like kingdom, um, domain, phylum, and there are specific classifications like species and subspecies. There is also breed, um, like when we talk about breeds of dogs, all dogs are the same species, right? But breed is a more specific way of classifying them. Breed only exists for domesticated animals, whereas species and subspecies exist for both um, domestic and uh, wildlife. So taxonomy shows us that wild wolves and domestic dogs share the same kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, and genus. They only differ at the species level. Um, so if we break it down, right, both dogs and wolves are animals. Uh, chordata means that they have a spine with bones. Um, they're mammals, they're carnivores, um, canidae, that's canids, uh, the dog family and then it's further broken down um, into the genus Canis. And that's the genus and species uh, scientific name is what helps us identify them or leads to the scientific nomenclature. So dogs are Canis familiaris and wolves are Canis lupus. So that's just helping us understand that species and subspecies are some of the most specific ways to classify animals. And that's what we're referencing when we talk about conservation status or an endangered species, um, a species that is very likely to become extinct in the near future, either worldwide or in a particular jurisdiction. So um, when a species in, is endangered, if uh, the situation keeps getting worse, that'll cause them to become extinct. And that means they have no living members and therefore are no longer in existence. And there are basically two um, ways that an animal can be extinct. They might be extinct in the wild, meaning that there's a certain number, usually a very small number, of that type of species left in captivity. And if there's none left in captivity, then they're just plain extinct. There's absolutely no living members of that species left. Um, and it, a species becomes extinct or is known as extinct when the last individual of the species dies, although the capacity to breed and re recover for that species may have been lost long before that point. So um, if there's two living members left, but they're both females or they're both males, the capacity to breed isn't there. So in effect, that species is extinct. So um, really the problem gets worse and worse as a species um, gets closer to the point of extinction and it is really hard for them to recover if there's very few of that species left. Whereas if we're um, paying attention and notice a species decline but there's still a large enough population to breed, um, then they can have a much easier time recovering into full capacity. And there are a few other ranks 
Um, so you can take a look at the little chart down here, but vulnerable um, is another level up. So a species that is a, at high risk of becoming endangered or close to becoming endangered. Near threatened is um, a species that is likely to become endangered sometime in the future, but uh, isn't at that point yet. And least concern is a species with low risk of becoming endangered. So it means that their population is usually healthy and abundant. So here you can see um, a black rhinoceros, which um, there is a subspecies we're going to talk about that is extinct, but they are um, pretty critically endangered. Um, and then raccoons, which um, we see fairly often, at least here in Illinois, but pretty much all over the United States. They definitely fall under that least concern category. Their populations are very healthy and widespread. So when we talk about population, um, for those of you who have seen the spay and neuter and overpopulation video, um, usually when we're talking about domestic animals like cats and dogs, we talk about overpopulation. Uh, but for wild animals, more often than not, um, we're talking about underpopulation. But once again, population just refers to a particular section, group, or type of people or animals living in a certain area or country. So in other words, it's just how many beings are in a particular area. And uh, this is directly tied to a species conservation status, depending on their population numbers in relation to um, what would be healthy. That's what determines if they're uh, endangered, vulnerable, near threatened, or least concern. And sometimes it may even be specific to a certain subspecies or re region. So like I mentioned a little bit, the western black rhino um, did go extinct, whereas the other three subspecies of black rhino, the eastern, south central, and southwestern, are still, um, you know, in existence, but they're critically endangered. So the western black rhino is gone forever, but um, we still have these other subspecies um, for at least a little while left in the wild. And then uh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or the IUCN Red List, is the most expansive inventory or database of the global conservation status of any animal, fungus, or plant species. So they really are a wonderful resource. You can Google them, go to the website, IUCN Red List, and look up information about any species. And it'll tell you if they are least concerned, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, extinct, so on and so forth. Um, so they're really a great use, um, a great tool for any scientist, um, interested citizen, legislators. Um, they provide a lot of very useful information for determining uh, conservation status. So currently they have around 128,500 species and counting. I read somewhere they um, would like to get the number up to around 160,000 species because um, they feel like that'll be the most, or at, up until this point, the most accurate way to kind of compare species and uh, biodiversity, which we're about to get into. Um, but looking closer at that, more than 35,500 species are threatened with extinction out of that 128,000. So around 40% of existing amphibians, 34% of conifers, which are a type of tree, 33% of reef building corals, 26% of mammals, and 14% of birds are all threatened with extinction. So that's... Uh, a sad statistic, unfortunately, um, when we're talking about endangered animals, um, it's um, definitely unfortunate that these animals face such a complicated situation. But uh, if we're acting as good citizens and doing everything possible, there are some good success stories that we'll get into as well. So I kind of already mentioned the term biodiversity, and you may have heard it in a science class or thrown around um, in the news. And uh, it is a very important term that's used to describe the variety of life in the world or in a particular habitat, in a particular habitat or ecosystem. Um, so whenever a species goes extinct, biodiversity in that habitat or ecosystem decreases. There's less variety. 
right? So um, we want as many species as possible because that means we have a diverse ecosystem. Um, and an ecosystem is a biological communi community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. So it's how everything interacts. And you can kind of see a little bit of uh, an ocean ecosystem here. Um, so the environment is important to the organisms living in it. The organisms support one another. Um, it's all interconnected. And uh, the reason biodiversity is a good measure of health in an ecosystem is because uh, less biodiversity really disrupts the balance between species. So um, if some if a species becomes extinct in an ecosystem, some of the remaining species won't have as much competition, right? And might become overpopulated. So if uh, dolphins, let's say we took out dolphins, they went extinct. Dolphins um, eat some of the same food as sharks, right? So if uh, dolphins were no longer there, then sharks might become overpopulated because dolphins aren't there to equal out the competition. And then other species might have the opposite effect where they'll have fewer resources and struggle to survive. Um, so let's say we, what's a good example? So if, um, let's say, zooplankton, right? It's a very, very small organism that a lot of tiny fish feed on. But if that zooplankton went extinct or um, decreased in population dramatically and impacts all the small fish that eat it, then they're going to really be competing with each other, not have enough of that zooplankton resource, and then their populations will be affected as well. So it's kind of like a chain reaction. Whenever one species in an ecosystem is impacted, it usually has a domino effect to the others. Um, so species diversity is crucial to the natural sustainability of all life forms because we're all interconnected, right? Um, you can think of things at the individual level, the population level, community, or the ecosystem, but really it's all species are always interacting with each other, even indirectly in an ecosystem. So if one is disrupted, it usually causes a domino or ripple effect to all the other species. So there are pretty much five main threats to biodiversity or five main reasons behind why um, and a species becomes endangered. So the first is encroachment which basically means that people are taking more space for uh, away from wild animals and wildlife to do what they want with that area. Um, so I thought this graphic was good to show that, you know, people really aren't leaving too much left of the slice of pie, <laughs> so to speak. They're um, taking pretty much all of the share and not leaving much for the wild animals. So as people continue to expand where they live, it gives um, wildlife smaller and smaller regions to live in. And uh, once again, that takes away some of those resources. So we might see species become endangered or extinct because they can't get to areas where they used to with precious resources that they need to survive. Habitat destruction is similar, but a little bit different. Usually encroachment focuses more on the expanding uh, area of humans and taking that area away from wildlife, whereas habitat destruction more focuses on using the resources in a given area. So um, think logging or the oil industry, um, different uh, pollutants um, that might affect and cause different plants not to grow. So it's taking away all of the resource for human use um, and destroying the habitat in the process. So oil spills are a good example of this, uh, cutting down the rainforest, um, anything that's taking the environment or ecosystem and using it for human purposes. 
instead of leaving that habitat there for the animals that need it. Hunting and trapping are another big threat to biodiversity. Um, the U.S., I must say, does have some really good laws when it comes to hunting. Um, people need hunting permits. Um, the money that they pay uh, for the permit actually goes directly to conservation of certain species, but not every country um, is as strict about regulating hunting. So in some countries, it's pretty much open season on any animal. And even in certain states, um, there are certain species that are hunted pretty badly here in the United States. Uh, trapping is somewhat similar. Usually, um, if anyone has seen Fox and the Hound, I think they show a uh, bear leg hold trap in that cartoon. Um, so it's using pretty inhumane methods to uh, trap an animal in place and then the person who is trapping the animal will go and collect that animal and same thing with hunting they're usually using the animal for meat or fur um, so these both are um, destroying or taking away biodiversity just um, so that people can use the animal as some kind of product like i said usually meat or fur um, so if it's strictly regulated it might not be too much of a problem, but if um, people are hunting and trapping at will, that'll definitely impact uh, biodiversity and a species conservation status. Uh, the exotic pet trade is another big one that's becoming more and more popular, unfortunately. Um, so when we talk about exotic pets, um, parrots definitely are kind of uh, the star child for exotic pets, although it could be anything. Any wild animal is not domesticated and don't make good pets, but there is a lot of money to having really cool exotic pets that no one else has ever heard of. Like um, some popular ones are sloths, uh, definitely parrots and other birds of prey. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, there was like this popular one, a slow loris. <laughs> um, so there's very niche, um, random species that people will pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for. Um, fennec foxes, that's another one that everyone loves to show off whenever they have a fennec fox. But most of these animals are not fit to be kept as pets, let alone in captivity. Um, many of them are endangered in the wild, so the children's movie Rio actually touches a lot on the exotic pet trade, which is why I use the graphic from there. Um, but unfortunately, it's um, a very popular thing that a lot of people take advantage of because in some areas, uh, people might not have a way of making money aside from participating in illegal activities like the exotic pet trade. Um, but people in developed areas like the United States have no problem paying tons of money for these animals that were taken out of their habitat. So the exotic pet trade, I could go on and on. It could be a um, PowerPoint in of itself, but it's definitely a huge contributor to endangered species and uh, threatening biodiversity. And then obviously pollution is another one that uh, really impacts the ecosystems and habitats that endangered animals live on. And if uh, their environment is polluted, that takes away, once again, resources that they rely on. Um, they might not have a good area to live. It could impact their health, like polluting the oceans we're seeing is having a really, really strong impact on lots of different aquatic species. Um, so pollution is definitely a big, big culprit in why we see so many animals becoming endangered. You may have heard of the term mass extinction, which basically means that um, animals are going at extinct at an alarming rate. And um, there's been several mass extinctions, right? When we think of the dinosaurs, right? That uh, while we're not exactly sure, we think, you know, the comet came and uh, wiped out all the dinosaurs, that definitely whatever caused it was a mass extinction. Um, but for the first time in history, humans are responsible for all of the current threats to biodiversity. Whereas, yeah, we have an idea that it was likely a meteor that hit, um, you know, Earth and changed everything for the dinosaurs. We know that 
these are the threats to our animals and uh, biodiversity currently. There isn't a meteor coming for Earth. We are the meteor on Earth, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so humans are responsible for all of these threats. And since the Industrial Revolution, which if you haven't talked about that in history, that's basically the point where um, development and industry, um, factories and products really became um, crucial to the civilization. And uh, we saw a lot of techn technological advancements all around uh, the developed world at that time. But since then, while it was great for people to have all these things accessible, the extinction rate of animals has increased exponentially. So that's what this graph shows here, um, where there's a pretty steep incline right before early 1900 of the rate of animals becoming extinct and it does follow pretty closely the trend of human population, which has also increased exponentially. So uh, pretty much as human population grows, habitat destruction increases because people are using more resources um, and need more space. Uh, more natural resources are used because there's more people in need of them and uh, they're going to cause more pollution and waste because there's more people using more things, so they're going to create more garbage. And if we look at uh, 10,000 years ago, what the world's um, weight of vertebrate land animals looked like, there was only about 1% humans compared to 99% wild animals. If you took the weight of all living land animals in the world about 10,000 years ago, very little of it would be humans that comprise that weight. Whereas today, if we take a look at all the different uh, land animals in the world, 32% of the weight would be accounted for by humans, 67% by livestock or farm animals that we use as a resource. They are animals, but um, Livestock are also a resource in a lot of ways, and uh, only 1% uh, would be comprised of wild animals. So things have pretty much flip-flopped. Um, we have taken over the planet and we are using it for what we want, and we left very little room for the wild animals that originally inhabited the planet. So it's, you know, um, something to think about, obviously. There's reasons for why this happened, but it's important for us to understand and try to come up with solutions that will help these animals that are threatened. So here's a really nice graphic um, that kind of shows the different types of animals and how many are threatened out of those assessed. So it's important to keep in mind when we're talking about endangered species that um, while scientists are really studying these things as best they can, these are just estimates. It's really hard to say every single species that's in existence, um, and especially when we're talking about different types of animals. Larger animals like birds, mammals, amphibians, we live close to, they're large, it's a little bit easier for scientists to have a um, fairly accurate estimate of uh, the rate of extinction, whereas uh, for smaller animals, they definitely get impacted um, a lot as well, and it is a lot harder to estimate those numbers and really have a good idea of which are threatened or how bad the problem is. So you can kind of see from these graphics that um, all of the red is the percentage of that type of animal that is threatened currently by extinction. And uh, there's quite a few, if you look down here, um, different types of life that have already gone extinct. So it's important to talk about what's being done and what can we do in order to protect these species. So um, the United States Endangered Species Act is a groundbreaking law that was passed in 1973. And really, uh, the ESA is one of the most important laws when it comes to wildlife and endangered species. Um, under the ESA, individuals or organizations can petition to have a species listed as endangered or threatened. So they basically gather signatures and evidence to show that this 
species is being threatened or endangered. Um, and these petitions go through a long process of getting scientifically evaluated, going under public review, and then a final decision is made based on the evaluation and review um, on if a species will be listed or protected under the ESA. Once listed, the Endangered Species Act requires protection for critical habitat areas. So it specifies what areas are critical habitat and no one is allowed to take or um, negatively impact an endangered species in any way. So it makes it very clear the legal definition of take is to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, collect, or attempt to engage in any such conduct. So um, it's pretty strict and airtight. If you are negatively impacting any endangered species in a critical habitat area, you can you are violating the Endangered Species Act and uh, can be punished accordingly. A species recovery plan is also developed um, and implemented for every listed species under the ESA. Scientists track the species population, and once they are at a recovered um, rate, they can be removed from the list. So that's a really good system for um, identifying which species are threatened, taking the proper steps to protect them while they are threatened, and then um, focusing on the science to get them back to a recovered rate. However, um, things to note, while the Endangered Species Act really is a phenomenal law and is so necessary, um, there is a growing gap between the number of listed species, which you can see here, and the amount of money spent per year uh, funding the recovery plans for those species. So while we are listing a lot of species, we're not increasing the budget for um, how much we're going to help those species, if that makes sense. So we need the budget to follow um, the trend of how many species are listed. Otherwise, there's not going to be enough funding to really make sure that those species are getting the protection they need. So many other countries have modeled their conservation laws using the Endangered Species Act. Um, the law allows for strict protection of, species, of different species while also requiring, requ requiring excuse me, uh, coordination between several levels of government, community, and the citizens. So it's a lot of collaboration and um, making sure that people on all of those levels are on the same page. So it's clear in a lot of ways, but also flexible. And that's why um, the ESA has been so successful over the years. So several endangered species have recovered thanks to the guidelines set in the Endangered Species Act. Uh, bald eagles are probably one of the most notable examples. However, it still took several actions by the government and uh, citizens to recover the bald eagle populations. Um, the the Endangered Species Act afforded more habitat protection for bald eagles in 1973, and uh, this was shortly after the government banned the hazardous pesticide DDT, which uh, they found was thinning the eggshells of the bald eagle eggs. Um, so that's why it was really crucial to ban that pesticide. If the pesticide was still being used, we probably wouldn't have seen um, the impact on bald eagle populations that we did. And then several regions uh, developed species recovery plans uh, over the next decade in the 1980s. And once the population recovered, it still is a long process to delist any animal from the Endangered Species Act, which is a good thing. We don't want these changes to um, come up all of a sudden. So um, the ESA, keep in mind, is a United States uh, specific law. So while other countries have modeled their laws after the Endangered Species Act, the Endangered Species Act really only applies to the United States. Um, it's the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, or CITES, um, which is the global agreement between uh, lots of different countries' governments to follow the same rules when monitoring, regulating, or banning international trade of endangered species. So um, the Endangered Species Act 
more so says um, this is the law for each species in the United States and what you're allowed to do with that animal or that species depending on their conservation status. Whereas CITES is saying here's um, if you're allowed to trade between countries. So um, it aims to protect endangered species by prohibiting or regulating trade, limiting commercial activity um, that impacts uh, their habitat and increasing funding for conservation. So uh, if we look at an example, CITES aims to prevent poaching by prohibiting the sale or trade of ivory, which many people have probably heard of or are aware that it is very illegal. Ivory is a product that comes from elephants, rhinoceros, um, it's part of their tusk, and it's very expensive because it comes from a live animal and um, it's uh, illegal. <laughs> so uh, they do make artwork out of it. You can kind of see in the picture down here, here's some recovered ivory um, from a smuggling ring. Um, so they create artwork and they try to sell it for high prices because um, it, it's coveted um, and is illegal. So there's just a black market demand for it, unfortunately. So CITES tries to prevent um, countries trading these things. So while it might be illegal to kill the elephants in some countries, it might not be illegal to own ivory in other countries. So um, that's why CITES is saying, nope, the trade or sale of these types of products or of endangered species is illegal. Between the two countries, they've made an agreement that this is an illegal action. So that's why it's still illegal for someone in the U.S. to buy ivory from like uh, someone in Asia who got it from an Asian elephant. Both the U.S. purchaser and the foreign seller would be violating CITES. So the Endangered Species Act is more about one single person taking that animal. Remember the weird definition of take, whereas um, CITES is more about the trade between two parties. So CITES, since it's a convention or a treaty really, includes 183 member parties or countries basically, which uh, meet every two years to discuss and make um, adjustments to the list of protected species. And around 35,000 species are regulated with trade agreements through CITES. Um, and they're assigned one of the three levels of protection. So they could have the strongest um, level of protection, which is appendix one. This includes species that are the most endangered and threatened. That means no trade is allowed whatsoever, except for very specific scientific purposes, but no type of um, trade for recreational purposes at all. Uh, Appendix two is uh, species that are not threatened by extinction just yet, but likely would be if unlimited trade were allowed. So trade is um, allowed under very, very strict rules and circumstances. So it probably outlines exactly the type of um, specifications someone need, would need in order to purchase uh, such a endangered species or product. And then uh, appendix number three is the most relaxed. This includes species whose trade is regulated within a specific country and that can be moved to appendix two if cooperation is needed between several countries. So uh, during my research, I was trying to figure out, I'm pretty sure coral falls under appendix two because um, there are pretty strict trade regulations um, on coral. It can be made into jewelry. And if I'm not mistaken, at one point it was under appendix one or totally banned, um, but it sounds like certain other countries want to be able to sell and trade coral and that it has recovered in certain areas. So that's why um, the in species itself could be moved amongst the appendices. So a couple other things to note about protecting wild animal species. The AZA, or the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, is an accreditation organization that establishes certain zoos as, or aquariums as having exemplary practices. So there's lots of different zoos and aquariums across the United States. However, um, in order to be AZA accredited, you know, it's um, an application process. They have to prove that they're doing certain standards. 
So the requirements are very strict and um, try to encourage zoos to focus on education and species survival first and foremost. So it's a really good thing if um, you are talking about a AZA accredited zoo or if you heard that a zoo or aquarium has AZA accreditation, you know that they're focusing on what's best for the animals. So that's why um, requirements include following species uh, survival plans for each endangered species that they have. So it's very specific to whatever species they have at their zoo or aquarium. And um, while keeping wild animals in captivity isn't ideal, what the AZA aims to do and zoos affiliated with AZA aim to educate the public about these animals while preserving the species first and foremost. So um, we want wild animals in the wild, but it is important to make sure that people, regular everyday people, understand why these animals are important in the wild. And um, if they were to go extinct in the wild, zoos have that species survival plan um, so that they might be able to reintroduce them. And actually that's what happened to the California condor. It was recovered this way because there were only about 27 individual condors in 1987. So there were only 27 left in the wild. That is very close to the verge of extinction. Like when I read it, it literally made my stomach churn um, before being reintroduced in, back into the wild in 1991. So they estimate that there are around um, 518 California condors living today. So you can see that it's still a slow process that um, after 30 years that uh, we're only up to around 500 condors, but from 27, that is um, an amazing turnaround. So um, if the California condor had not been kept in zoos, then it probably wouldn't exist. Luckily, they had that captive population and were able to create a breeding program. Um, so sometimes it really depends, um, but Overall, uh, AZA and AZA accredited zoos do their best to make sure that they have plans for these animals and preserve them. Some other notable U.S. laws are the 1900 Lacey Act, which uh, banned illegal wildlife trafficking. Uh, I kind of mentioned the 1934 Duck Stamp Act, so um, hunters have to buy duck stamps and that helps fund uh, the conservation of species um, that they're allowed to hunt. In 1966, the Environmental Policy Act, which eventually gave way into the um, Environmental Protection Agency in 1970. Uh, the Clean Air Act of 1970 regulates air emissions to prevent pollution. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act of 1980 provides state assistance, so both financial and uh, practical assistance for conservation plans. Um, 1992 Wild Bird Conservation Act limits imports of exotic bird species, which uh, as we talked about is definitely a good thing since there's a high demand for exotic birds and exotic pets. 1972, the Marine Mammal Protection Act prohibits taking or importing of marine mammals. But those are all US specific laws. Um, some notable international treaties are the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and the Interventional Conven International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling. Um, so the Migratory Bird Treaty Act aims to protect birds um, with migratory patterns across several different countries. And then the Interne International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling um, banned uh, the act of whaling for commercial purposes. The only ones allowed to um, participate in whaling, which if you are unaware, is hunting whales usually for their um, blubber, for meat or um, kerosene, but we don't need that anymore. So very few countries um, were whaling for um, resource purposes. Some still do for recreational purposes, and that has been banned but not uh, all countries agree to it. There are a few countries that um, don't want to take part in the international convention. But overall, these um, have really helped the species that were affected. So uh, whale and bird populations um, for the endangered species 
uh, that were affected have really turned around and improved over time. So what are some simple things as citizens we can do? Um, it's important to learn about endangered species where you live because um, endangered species are specific to each ecosystem and region. So um, we do have certain endangered species here in Illinois we'll talk about and you want to make sure that um, you're paying attention to where they live so that you're not going in there and disturbing. If there's anything that you can be doing to um, modify your home to make sure that an endangered species doesn't um, find its way and get stuck somewhere. So just be aware of what types of animals live around your area. Um, visit a national wildlife refuge, park, preserve, or sanctuary. There's plenty of ways to uh, see these animals, um, learn about them from organizations that will further their conservation. So um, national wildlife refuges uh, and preserves, um, wildlife parks and sanctuaries, all are, as long as they're nonprofit organizations or government affiliated, um, their goal is to protect those animals. So it's definitely worth supporting them. So make your home wildlife proof. Um, you definitely want to cover up any small areas where wildlife can get into. Um, sometimes uh, there might be certain things specific to where you live. So definitely check your animal control um, website they will have suggestions on ways to make sure that your home is wildlife proof so that animals aren't getting stuck in certain places or making a home out of areas um, in our home that we don't want them to because um, it's natural for them to be curious and look for places to hide and it's um, important for us to understand that we're the ones who have taken away a lot of their habitat so that's why they're coming onto our property a lot of the time um, only plant native species. Invasive species disrupt the ecosystem. So this is another topic that could probably be a PowerPoint all of itself. Um, a native species, it means that that species originated in the region where it's found. An invasive species is one that um, is not original to that area and is now taking over. Um, so basically invasive species might not have that competition that normal native species do. Um, and if there is no other species to keep the invasive one in check, that's how they really take over the ecosystem. Um, so never mix different species, um, only plant species that you know belong in that region and originated in that area. Um, so once again, that information can be found on your local forest preserve or um, government uh, county website. Um, avoid chemicals that are hazardous or leave pollutants. So um, it's important that we're being very conscious of what kinds of chemicals we're using. We don't want to put just anything into the environment like the DDT pesticide that um, originally it was just meant to kill insects and pests, right, um, to protect our plants and agriculture. But it had the unintended effect of thinning the bald eagle eggshell uh, shells, <laughs> eggshell um, layers. So um, we really want to make sure that we're avoiding hazardous chemicals and we're not leaving anything that will um, be found in the ecosystem for years to come. And obviously this kind of goes along with reduce, reuse, recycle. I'm sure you guys have heard that phrase a ton and it really is that important. Um, it definitely relates to global warming, which once again is a topic in of itself, but um, these we need the environment for the animals, especially endangered species, right? Their environment is being taken away. That's one of the reasons they're likely endangered. So um, if we're not using as much um, and not creating as much waste, we're trying to um, reduce the amount that we're using, um, buying sustainable products and trying to think about using less overall, all of those things will mean less waste in the environment and healthier ecosystems, more habitat for our endangered species. So definitely try to think before you use and uh, definitely think before you throw away. Um, encourage other people not to purchase exotic pets or products made from endangered species. So it's not 
very popular amongst most people to own ivory or scrimshaw or, you know, have uh, exotic pets, but it is um, a status symbol to a lot of different people. Um, even wearing fur coats, a lot of that is to flaunt money. That's the reason a lot of people have exotic pets is to show, oh, look, I paid a bunch of money so I can have something super unique. And it's at the cost of that animal's livelihood. So really try to educate and encourage other people not to partake in purchasing products like that um, because it's really just going to further diminish those species populations and um, eventually those species might be gone. So we don't want to only be left with um, piles of ivory tusks and no elephants. Protect wildlife habitat by cleaning up litter, using less resources, and keeping your distance. So while it's great to appreciate wildlife, we never want to interfere with where they're living. We don't want to take away from the resources they need and obviously don't want to leave behind garbage that um, could affect their daily lives. So make sure that we're leaving as little impact on them as possible. And one of the best things you can do, please, Call your legislators or um, the people who run our government, right? Call your state legislators. Um, the fact of the matter is that, the ch the ch is that change needs to happen on a very large scale. And working together, we can make a difference, but we also need the help of uh, governments in multiple countries to protect all the species that need protecting. Uh, what was it, 35,000? Uh, animals are listed as threatened, so that's a lot of different species to worry about. And as we kind of talked about, um, time is of the essence. As a species nears becoming extinct, the harder it is to recover, whereas if we catch it early on, the easier they will have um, at a chance of recovery. So it really is important to act now. Insist on change from your local legislators because the animals can't wait. So I thought it would be fun just to go over a couple of different species um, to see what you guys think. If you think that they are extinct, extinct in the wild, uh, what is that? Critically something, I forgot. <laughs> uh, endangered, vulnerable, near threatened, or um, least concerned. I think this is critically endangered. Yeah, endangered and critically endangered. I don't know why it says R, but um, think in your head, I'll give you um, about five seconds to decide what the piping plover, um, what is the piping plover's conservation status? So the piping plover is found um, near the shore of Lake Michigan, um, and they are an endangered species. Um, many uh, birds and species that live along any type of coastline are often um, threatened or endangered because of um, how much our coastlines and shores are used for trade. Um, so definitely uh, species living near water. Uh, or between ecosystems a lot of the time are very at risk. In ecosystems a lot of the time are very at risk. So how about the cardinal, which if I'm not mistaken is the Illinois state bird. Do you think the cardinal is extinct, endangered, least concerned? So the cardinal is least concern. I know sometimes it feels like it's rare or special when you see um, a beautiful red cardinal outside your window, but uh, their population is very healthy, so they are of least concern. How about the pallid sturgeon? Do you think they are least concerned, vulnerable, critically endangered, extinct? So the pallid sturgeon is endangered. And they are a uh, native species to Illinois. 
So how about the common carp? And once again, this status might be different for subspecies, but for the species common carp. They are vulnerable. And how about the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly? I've definitely seen uh, the Heinz Emerald around uh, some lakes and streams, ponds. So do you think they're threatened or of least concern? They're actually near threatened. So even though they seem fairly common, um, it's always um, scientists have a very specific way of figuring out the healthiest point of a population for a given species, and that's what's um, used to compare to the actual population numbers. So the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly is near threatened. And I thought this was a very good quote to um, kind of get the point across of how important it is to act um, towards protecting endangered species. Uh, to build may have to be the slow and laborious task of years. To destroy can be the thoughtless act of a single day. And that's uh, from Winston Churchill. He, so basically, um, and the picture kind of shows, even though he's uh, building this um, development or agriculture, whatever is going on over here, Think about how long it took nature to create this beautiful rainforest in the back over here, probably thousands and thousands of years. But to destroy it can happen so, so quickly, and then it's gone forever. So it really is important to act now um, to save our endangered species. Like I said, call your legislators, make sure that you're educated on um, local endangered species in your area, and uh, through working together, hopefully we'll protect them all. So thank you guys for tuning in today. I'll see you guys next week for another Pals and Paws live webinar. Bye.